Okay, please welcome Amber. Thank you. Okay, so you have to excuse me if I start speaking really fast. New Zealanders, when they get nervous, talk at a rate of knots. So throw something at me, do something, wave. I don't know if, if I'm going too quick. So I'm talking about flow mapping today. So I want you to picture this. We've got a potential disruptive, world-changing product. We've got three agile teams. We've got waterfall stakeholders. <laughs> We've got siloed team areas, so people are working very much niche. There's not a lot of really good communication between them. We don't have a lot of cross-functionality either. Okay, this thing is a real-time bidding platform. So it's very data heavy. It's got real-time tracking, and it's got uh, processing required at the point as well. So this is in the online game space. So the, you know, there's going to be one or two users across web and application. We're talking billions of records. We're talking hundreds of thousands of, of multiple connections in there. And the, uh, the thing about this is that management has come up with this wonderful idea that they're going to do a soft product launch in three weeks to coincide with an international games conference in Amsterdam. Has anybody else got sweaty palms? You know, like these guys were like, OK, that's a little bit dodgy, but I think we can do this. I think we can make this work. They've got three confirmed beta clients. Now, this is actually really cool, and these guys aren't tiny players. They're, they're quite big, so they're really proud about this. The thing that they have, though, is they've got this bulk uploading component. They need to make sure that they can get their current data into the system, and they need to start getting historical data into the system as well, so that you can get analytics, you can start allocating its profiles, all this kind of stuff. Your current data uploading is actually going pretty good. You know, there's nothing too bad going on. There's no real problems. Ish. <laughs> so they're in 10 days of, of processing of the historical data. And the current data is actually fine. It's, it's streaming. Everything's good. But 10 days of starting to, to process the historical stuff, starting to get a little bit of weirdness. You know, things are randomly stopping, but it's, it's okay. They've stopped the flow for five days to see if the process is going to catch back up again. Things seem to be working. So we've got a little bit of a false sense of security going on here. It's like, yes, we can actually do this until we get to 20 days of data. Okay, 20 days of data, now this is when it starts getting really, really bad. The enrichment layer over the top of this data is now beginning to fail quite miserably. And we're getting even more weirdness on top of this. We don't know how to trace it. We don't know where it's coming from. OK, now we've moved to one month. And we've promised these guys that we can get one year. And we're talking everything's going down. We're getting complete halts across everything. We've got multiple failures across all the different areas of the system. And of course, what's going to happen after this? We have the panic button. The business owners are pressing the panic button, the developers are pressing the panic button, the head of product is pressing the panic button, and nobody is knowing exactly what's happened here. And they've got some smart people. They've got really good, good, smart people. And effectively, this was a recipe for disaster that nobody actually realized. Now, now that we've done this, I can introduce myself. <laughs> so I'm Amber, um, and I'm an agile coach. I'm probably one of the few people in here who's not a developer. I am a massive nerd, but I'm not a developer. Um, I do things like Scrum and Kanban and process adaption. And my favorite thing is visualizing work, so different ways of visualizing work. Um, I've got a whole bunch of agile qualifications and, and all of that stuff. But the thing that I love the most is this process adaption and how to, how to try and get this theoretical work, which is sitting inside people's heads or inside documents and models that the people don't really see anymore, how to get that out and in front of teams and in front of business owners so that they understand it. So like software architecture is an intellectually graspable abstraction of a complex system. I like this quote and I cannot remember where it came from, but in the final version, I do promise that I will put like a little credit on the bottom. And you know, this is actually a really, really good way of looking at what we do when we design anything. It could be an app, it could be, um, could be a web app, it could be a native app doesn't matter. Now, these guys, they had a lot of smart people. They actually had a really good idea at a high level of what they wanted to do. 
They had their queues, they've got the bidder, they've got some, some really good scalable ways of making sure that stuff fails. And this is a very simplified version of that, just, just saying. But what they tend to rely on as we move through this process, what we rely on is looking at something like this. We don't really have any context here, and when we need to do this fault finding, we have to go back to stuff like this, back to a flat backlog, back to Jira, back to the stories that we're working on to try and figure out what it was that actually went wrong, and we try and trace our steps backwards. So one of the things that we don't have here is a lot of depth. I mean, like, what the hell? Who's doing this work? Where are the teams? And this is my personal favorite one. Whenever I show anyone from business a Jira backlog is, what is this unscheduled thing? And the what is this unscheduled thing? And this is terrifying for them because they see this big thing of red and they don't understand it. That's all right. More pressing of the panic button, right? But what we understand from this is that dependencies are not actually revealed particularly well through a flat backlog. So how can we expose these dependencies? And how can we do cool things like add this depth into the backlog? So the one thing that I understand about backlogs is that a lot of the time on the teams that I've worked with, when I start working with them, they will say, we have a story. Story may say, as Bob, I need a thing. And, and people start working on it. There's absolutely nothing more than that. Like a couple of the good ones might have some acceptance criteria. It's like, ooh, OK, you guys are going really well. The really good teams that I work with they start using things like uh, they append all their designs, they append files to their stories. They start getting that depth, and that depth gives them something that they can then go back and look at. So to link this back to what I'm talking about, in 2010, I saw my first flow map. Now, I was working with a coach in New Zealand called Mike Lowry, and he was, I was actually very lucky that he was the guy that introduced me to Agile. Um, a very disciplined Agile person. He liked Scrum by the book, which is kind of like that too. And I absolutely fell in love with it. And I think one of the reasons I fell in love with it is that I'm, I'm now an agile coach, but I'm kind of a recovering business analyst. So I like drawing flow charts, and I like trying to figure out what it starts here, where it touches, and how it ends up down here. So what exactly is a flow map? So a flow map is many things. It's a process overview. It is a dependency early warning system. It's a living documentation tool. It's a method to give context to the flatness of a backlog. It gives context to stories, and it's a way to link architecture to implementation. It also helps with the contextual planning and implementation. And I mean, if I could call it a flow map, you could call it a flow chart too, right? It's just effectively somebody standing in a whiteboard and starting at one point and ending somewhere else and mapping out the points that it touch. Now, I have like some, this is some big jargony stuff that I wrote. I'm quite impressed with this. The map arranges system architecture in order of priority events or the order in which you would describe the activi uh, activities to explain the behavior of the system and identify touch points. Oh, blah, 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 blah. There's too many words, right? So effectively what it does is it slices through a process from end to end. Just one process. Sometimes the one that failed. <laughs> in fact, most of the time that's the best one to start with. It's a little big picture. So we've got a lot of the time when I'm working with architects, I see a lot of big picture stuff. We see representations of entire areas of work. And we see how these things connect together with arrows and lines, and they bounce over other lines and stuff. But what we don't see is this granularity. So actually, what happens when we get into working at this thing here, how does this thing really work? And these are the things that, that I'm going to be talking about today. I was like, well, that's nice. Why do I need this? Aha, let's look at Company X. So Company X had some smart people. They had some really good, they had some really good thinkers over the top of this. They had a nice big picture, they had a good scalable system, but it still failed miserably, right? They still had catastrophic failure, and they still had, at this stage, I think about a week and a half to figure out why everything wasn't working. And so I got to put this thing called the Agile Straw Man. Now, the Agile straw man is when you're designing a new system from, from the ground up, you want to look at the most risky thing, like the thing that if you can't do this, then really you shouldn't start designing a UI or you shouldn't start working on the other peripheral things. You need to find this most risky part, map it up, and do it first in a very basic way. And maybe that means that you've got to mock some of the data from other areas in order to, to see if you can actually get from A to B. But if you can't get from A to B, there's, there's no point in starting. 
absolutely no point. So essentially, you start at the start, do the system killer, go through action by action, and if you want to, you can add depth by going just beyond the process. So maybe you want to put the areas of the UI that it touches, because UI and architecture are actually quite nicely linked, as I have learned. So I'm going to take you through the steps of how you do this. So step one, find the most risky part of the system. How do you know which the most risky part of the system is? The most risky part is that if it fails, you're going to get this face popping up on developers and business people all over the place. Like, how could we not see this? Okay, what you've got to do is you've got to find it. You've got to figure out how to fix it. So in, in the example here of uh, Company X, what they had is they had their tracker and they had their internal enricher and then they had their bulk here also with the internal enricher before it was going into the queues, before the bidder was even touching anything. And what they were finding is that the, the coupling of the, the bulk with the enrichment was the thing that was causing the problems. It was causing problems because the enricher was actually crumbling under the weight of the data that it was all trying to process. There was just too much of it to handle. And we're only talking one client. What happens when you put three in there? What happens when you got 50, 100, 200, 3 million? You don't have a system anymore. You've just got a series of stops. You don't have a business. Send everybody home. So what's the next step in this? Once you've found this point of failure, you want to start engaging with people. You want to talk to your team. You want to get out of the room. You want to get out of these little tiny rooms, and you want to actually start talking with the people that this affects. We want to figure out how we can make it work better. So that's not just looking at your developers, it's talking to your system people, it's talking to your system administrators, your database administrators, pulling as many people as you can into this one room and seeing how you can do it better. You've got to plan it out. So in the case of company X, what they did is they split out this bulk uploader from the enrichment process. The enrichment process now is treated with, it's got its own separate layer. And they realized that if they started shoving everything through in one pipeline, then they've got one point of failure. And if that one point of failure failed, well, it just it stops, right? So what they did is they actually split this so that we have concurrency. So if one, one of them fails, it'll shuffle down to the next one. They just keep going. They can fix the top one. Things keep processing. So the third step in here, the third step, and this is, this is the part that makes it a flow map is when you're actually sitting down with your team now, you know how it works, you know what you want to achieve. This is when you sit down, and I have to say I faked this, as you might be able to see. The original one that we had, we actually tore it down, I never got any photos of it. So I've had to build this back up from scratch, blah, 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 blah. What you want to do is look at the different areas. You can look at them as being epic areas. Um, want to start putting the stories that you need onto the board. So it's kind of very similar in effect to, to story mapping. It's a way of visualizing an entire backlog's worth of stories in a different way. We want to do things like using color to categorize what the work is. So color can be used to categorize dependencies between different teams. Color can be used to categorize uh, things like different areas that you're touching, different components. Um, you can also use it to do things like, we know we have a lot of technical debt in this area, so we're going to make all of these ones red, which means they're dodgy to touch. I mean, you, it doesn't matter how you use it, as long as you use it. Okay, and then the fourth step here is enhancement. So what we want to think of, especially in the case of these guys, if you like this guy, he's pretty cute, huh? So the fourth step is enhancement. If we've only got one week to build something, we can't build the whole thing. This is this just enough, just in time, uh, you know, providing a bike before you provide a Ferrari. So we want to look at how we can add layers of enhancement into this map as well. And maybe this is in a very similar fashion that you would use a story map. Maybe this is slicing through the system with lines. Maybe it's actually shuffling them down so that you've got separate groups. Again, you could use color, doesn't matter as long as you've got the things that you know that you need to do now because these are the critical functions, and then there's the nice to haves. You have to make sure you make that distinction, especially when you're so time poor, because you don't, you literally, when you only have a week and a half before the soft product launch, thank you, management, you're going to have to figure out the important parts first. So now we get down to maintenance. 
How do we do this? How do we keep it relevant? So the thing about using a map like this is that you don't want to have it hidden away in a room, and you really don't want to have it inside a tool. What you want to do is you want to treat it similar, that you, uh, similar to having a visual workspace. So having a board that your team would work to and interact with. You want people actually touching the stories. So it means having it somewhere very obvious. It means putting it in the space that you're in. It means something that you can drag around with you to meetings if there's changes. You need to be able to interact with it physically. And there's a reason for that. I'll get to this after this. The other thing you need to do is you need to make sure that you update it. And in a very basic way, this means that if you finish something inside your inside your says like you've you've got stuff that's working, cross it off, pull the pull the story off the board, give it a tick. I, I don't know. Figure out some way of making sure that whatever you can represent inside your tool is represented up on the board as well. If you're lucky enough to have an agile coach, I mean these guys didn't. <laughs> they had management that didn't actually believe that Agile could work to start with, so Scrum Masters were just things that you, you, you don't, you, additional waste. In actual fact, these are the guys that take care of process stuff like this. It takes it off the team that gives the team more space to be able to do the good work. Get to the fun stuff. So there's, there's other things that you need to consider as well. And when you're building one of these things, what are the differences between a, a first time pass through a system and using existing products. Now, Company X, they already had stuff in, in place. They had architecture in place. They used this technique to make sure that they got the correct level of granularity. Um, you want to look at the type of product or service that you're doing. You want to look or think if you're using uh, multi-teams. So if, you, if you're working with just one team, that's actually good. It means your points of communication failure are low. But if you've got two, three, four, five teams, maybe you've got distributed teams, then you need to figure out really fast how you can actually start communicating this. And this is when you need to make sure that whatever you've done in the physical world gets into a tool and it gets updated regularly. And these updates are communicated really clearly. Uh, you need to figure out if you've got actors or other roles in the system that you need to take, take consideration of. Uh, UI and UX is a really important thing too. Like for this. Um, for Company X, they needed to make sure with these, with these beta clients coming on board that the UI and the UX had to be tight on the front. And this is one of the reasons that the less sexy bulk uploading work really didn't get done, because it was less sexy than working on the fun stuff in the UI in the front. Uh, there's also microservices, and there's like cloud versus self -host. There's probably about 50 other things that you can stick on those lists. But this is, these are ones that, that I've come across most recently. So. In summary, and I'm like, I'm doing pretty good here, right? All right. <laughs> Throw it away. In summary, what you want to do is you want to go through your system. You want to find the points of critical failure. You want to have a think about if, if everything went down, where would it go down, and what is the thing that's going to cause, cause this critical fail? You want to stand in front of a whiteboard with as many people as possible, and you want to map it out. You want to map it out in its current state so that you understand exactly what it's doing. And then you want to look at ways of making it better. Once you've made it better, you want to take the stories with your team. You want to put those stories onto the board. And after that, you just have to keep it fresh. So with that, are there any questions? <laughs> If you don't have so questions. Having a physical board, the, what do you do with distributed teams? Like when the models are really complex, I mean they're really heavy, they've got a lot of detail, it just goes crazy. How do you preserve that so that you can transfer it between teams might be on other sides of the globe? Okay. So the question was, um, what do you do if you've got distributed teams? What if you've got teams that are on the other side of the globe? How do you actually communicate these things? So with this kind of map, you want to start physical, and then you want to try and put it into something like Glyphy. I know Glyphy is actually really good. A lot of people are using Jira, so you can tie the Glyphy maps back to the Jira stories. And um, what we would do is also add links to the individual epic areas or the individual story areas in there. And we would have this diagram attached to the epic, and then we would be relying on that really heavily. So um, again, this was this the 
the time that I'm using this with a distributed team, this was successful because you had a somebody like me who was making sure that those updates happen. You need to make sure somebody takes accountability for that, otherwise it turns into another piece of dead documentation. Thank you. Is there another one? Other questions? Yeah. Uh, this would be a more silly question, I guess, and more straight question. So do you want to wait for the, do you want to wait for the mic? Yeah, yeah. Go on. So, um, what's the, uh, uh, the uh, I mean, uh, what do you mean by exactly a scrum and, and, uh, and, uh, and sprint? Uh, well, we have a different thing, like, you know, but the main distinguish between a scrum and an uh, agile. So wh how do you distinguish? You know, there are ah, many okay. things which, which will, uh, you know, come together, but we, and we have seen a lot of things, you know, but what's the main, uh, you know, a few points that are going to distinguish between each of these two? Okay, between Agile and Scrum? I don't think we've got enough time to go into this, sir. <laughs> okay, well, like, Scrum is a specific framework. It fits within Agile. Agile is designed to be responsive to change. So Scrum is one of many methods that's <coughs> borrowed from other methods over time that allows you to do iterative development. And it's, it's short, sharp iterations that are time boxed. So that's one of the main differences in Scrum. If you're using something like Kanban, Kanban is single piece flow and it's continuous. There are no sprints, there's just keeping work going through the system. But if you want to come and find me afterwards and have a talk about this, I've got hours worth of information for you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes. Hi. Uh, this might be a little bit unfair because it's not strictly the focus of your talk, but it, it did come in in the case study. Okay. Um, there are sort of two different ways you can sequence the work, or at least two ways. One is you do the most valuable thing for the customer first, mm -hmm. because why bother doing anything else because the project might be canceled, right? So you, yep. you sort of do it in order. Uh, the other way of doing it is you put the riskiest things first, because if you can't figure out how to do those, it doesn't matter how many things you got right if you couldn't get the batch upload to work. Yes. Uh, so I'm just wondering if you had any, <clears throat> rather than waiting for the rage phase to occur uh, in the nth iteration, <laughs> Uh, if, if, in fact, it might have made sense for them to consider a different model if they seriously had any, any risks that they thought might sink the whole project. Okay, well, the, um, that's a really fascinating one. We were lucky enough the first time I started using these is that we had, we had both of these things combined. Um, it was working for an online distance learning provider and we were trying to have uh, work that was marked by a tutor get entered into a system, which sounds actually pretty simple, but it was, it was all designed to be done online. And we had to start in SharePoint and end up in Oracle. And this thing was like, it was, it was horrific. I mean, the domain model for, for this took up about five panels of, of this wall here. It was, it was I don't even know who wrote that, but, but they really made themselves some money for at least six years because nobody else could understand it. The thing about that was if we couldn't write to that system, then effectively we were losing the most valuable thing and we were proving that we couldn't do it to start with. So in terms of trying to evaluate that, that's a really good question. Um, I'd probably throw that back to the product people because being just the agile coach, I kind of just help with the process in between. But there'd be ways of assessing what value these things were to the customer. And there's tangible and intangible values. So like a tangible benefit would be, does this thing return us money? Intangible benefit would be, could we improve our processes to work faster? And these things need to be taken into consideration and given pretty much an equal footing. And then it's up to the business to decide after that. So the question, or the answer to this, and I don't know if there's anybody I was uh, sitting with in lunch today, it was like, it depends. <laughs> Classic answer for an agile coach. We got anything else? All right. Thanks again, Amber. Okay. Thank you, thank you very much.